Hello and welcome to Helping Focus. You're watching Dr. Laura. Thank you for joining me once again. I'm starting the first part of bladder cancer today. I've already covered bowel cancer and I've also covered breast cancer in the B Overcoming series. So today I'll be dealing with part one of bladder cancer. Thank you for joining me. First thing is just to have a look at the diagram of the kidney system, the renal system. And as you can see, and from the anatomy of the renal system, the bladder, which is a little orange bag, little balloon sac-like structure, in the pelvis of what appears to be there, a male body. The bladder itself is an expandable muscular balloon-like structure and it's found in the pelvic area. Now the function of the bladder is to collect and store urine, which is manufactured from the kidneys and it's stored in the bladder where it is ready to be expelled at a later time. So that's what the bladder does. Now the bladder has got such a large capacity that it can actually extend to contain almost, well actually more than half a litre of water. Some people's bladder capacity is as much as 600 to 700 mils of urine. That's quite a large capacity, would you not say, <laughs> of, of urine. Now, what is urine? Of course, urine is a waste product. It's made up of water and waste products that are filtered by the kidneys. It passes from the kidneys down into the tubes called the ureters and then from the ureters into the bladder. And then when the bladder is full, it gives out a signal to the brain to say, time to empty me, please, empty me, please. And that's exactly what happens. And so the, the brain sends signals back to the bladder muscles, causes them to contract and to squeeze, to expel the urine. And that's what happens. And of course, that is expelled out of the body. Now, the, two, the, the organ, the, the tube through which the urine is expelled from the bladder to outside the body is called the urethra. In the man, the urethra is quite a long structure and, in, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long tube. It passes through the prostate gland and then out through into the penis. And I'm just going to show you a diagram of that in a minute. In the woman, however, the urethra is very, very short and it lies just in front of the vagina. So here's a picture of the male urethra, as you can see, from the bladder, the tube goes down into, past the prostate glands, which are on both sides, supporting both sides of the urethra, into the penis, and then of course out into the, um, out, of, out of the body, basically. And now we've got the female version, which is the short urethra in the female bladder. So there we have it. Now, urine, the interesting thing about the bladder is that urine is not absorbed. It's got an impermeable wall, this bladder, that doesn't allow urine to be absorbed because obviously the urine, by the time it gets to the bladder, is waste material. And we don't want to reabsorb that waste material. The water needs to be, you know, even though there's water in it, that water has waste material in it. So we don't want to absorb that back into the body. So the, the bladder has urethro, uh, ure, urethelial or transitional cells which stop reabsorption of the urine back into the body. And this is just a cross section. If you just cut, cut the bladder in, in half, this is a cross section. And in the, inner, in the inner layer there, you will see the transitional cells, which unfortunately are also where bladder cancer starts, but a little bit of that later. Now, continue with the anatomy of the bladder. The wall of the bladder is very thick when it is empty, almost similar to the uterus in non-pregnant uterus, very small, very thick. But as the bladder fills up with urine, it becomes thicker and thicker and, th and becomes thinner and thinner and thinner, and it also moves upwards 
in the abdominal cavity. So if somebody has a very, very full bladder, it can, it's actually possible to feel their bladder. And I remember as a junior doctor in, in medical school, having to catheterize patients suprapubically, where you, you, know, you had to get a catheter into the patient through the abdomen rather than through the urethra, because for whatever reason, they may have had a urethral stricture, a tightening of the urethra, where you couldn't pass a catheter up through the urethra, so we had to go through what they call a, a suprapubic catheter. And one of the things we had to do was to feel and to sound by percussing the abdomen, to feel and to sound for the level of the bladder for this poor person who may have had urinary retention. And sometimes the bladder was so full, this person hadn't been able to pass urine, the bladder was so full, it actually got quite up to the umbilicus. And the relief and the joy and the, oh, the gratitude from a patient who has urinary retention, when you pierce the, even though there is a bit of pain, you know, you use a bit of local anesthetic, but you still got to go through with a, with a, a very thick needle, you still got to go, I hope I'm not causing some of you to be squeamish out there, but you know, something I had to do all the time, you go through the abdominal wall and you go into the bladder, you attach the, the needle to the catheter and you pass the catheter in and then, then you have to basically stitch the catheter in place in the side of the walls of the abdomen. Pretty gory, but it worked wonders for the poor patient who was in retention. So basically, that just goes to show, and really the whole reason I said that was to say that the, catheter and the bladder can extend to quite high up in the abdomen. So bladder cancer is what we're talking about. Let's talk about the facts about bladder cancer, some statistics. Bladder cancer is the seventh most common um, cancer in the UK. It's more common in men than in women, as you can see. Um, thankfully, it, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know it, a lot of it is caught in the early stages, and so a lot of people can survive. The five-year rate of survival is about 90%. Each year, about 10,000 people are diagnosed with bladder cancer. And as I said, 80% in the early stages. Bladder cancer grows very, very slowly, which is a bonus indeed. And so it's obviously something that, you know, that it, as, because it doesn't go very fast, um, you have a lot of survivors from it. Um, it is directly related to smoking cigarettes. If there's one taken message from bladder cancer is that smoking is a direct causative factor of bladder cancer directly related to smoking. The outlook is very good. If the cancer hasn't spread through the walls of the bladder, there's a survival rate of 90% after five years. But the bad news is that there is a high recurrence rate of bladder cancer. So they, um, people usually need a year to two yearly follow-ups because of this. Now, there's a diagram here of a cross-section through the wall of the bladder, and it, it, it really just demonstrates the different stages of bladder cancer, when the cancer is located just within the wall, and if you go basically clockwise from about seven o'clock, when it's just in the superficial layers of the transitional, the urethelium, and as you pr proceed clockwise, the, ca the cancer becomes more invasive until it actually passes through the cancer and through the bladder wall, and then it becomes a problem. We're now going to watch a little clip on bladder cancer, and then we'll come back and talk some more about bladder cancer. The urinary system is composed of two kidneys, two ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. The kidneys remove waste products from the blood and form urine. Urine then travels through the tube-like ureters and is stored in the bladder before it is eliminated from the body via the urethra. The bladder is the hollow-shaped organ that expands and contracts to collect and eliminate urine. As with all organs in the urinary system, 
the bladder is susceptible to developing cancer, the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells. The wall of the bladder has several layers of tissue. Bladder cancer type depends on the types of cells and layers of tissue affected. There are three types of bladder cancer. Transitional cell. This type of cancer begins in the transitional cells. These cells form the innermost layer of the bladder, allowing the bladder to stretch when it is full and shrink when it is emptied. It is the most common site of bladder cancer. Squamous cell. This type of cancer is a slow growing cancer of the thin flat cells that line the surface of the bladder. Adenocarcinoma, cancer that begins in the glandular or secretory cells of the bladder. Symptoms of bladder cancer can include blood in the urine, frequent urination, or feeling the need to urinate without being able to do so. Pain during urination. Men are more likely to develop bladder cancer than women. Bladder cancer is more common in whites than in blacks. Risk factors for bladder cancer include smoking tobacco, long-term exposure to certain workplace chemicals or carcinogens, such as those used in making rubber, textiles, paints, and dyed clothing, a diet high in fats and fried foods, having a history of recurrent bladder infections, long-term use of urinary catheters, being over age 60. If cancer is suspected, diagnostic studies can include cystoscopy, an imaging study where a tube with a lens is placed into the bladder through the urethra, urine culture and cytology, laboratory studies that analyze urine for bacteria and cancer cells. Biopsy, the removal of bladder cells for examination under a microscope, imaging studies, such as MRI, CT scan, and IVU, intravenous urography, that provide a detailed picture of the urinary system. Treatment and prognosis depend on the stage and grade of the cancer and the location of the tumor. Treatment options for bladder cancer can include surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and biologic therapy. And welcome back to Dr. Laura, Health and Focus, talking about bladder cancer. And this is part one of bladder cancer. In part two, we're going to be talking about prevention, particularly with diet and lifestyle. So you, you, you saw about the risk factors here, but I'd just like to go through them again. The risk factors for bladder cancer, the, the most primary causative cause for factor for causing bladder cancer is smoking. It is the biggest risk factor and the risk gets worse the longer and the more cigarettes a person smokes. The cigarette has lots of carcinogenic chemicals in it and even though they're filtered you know by the kidneys unfortunately they are absorbed into the urethral cells. So um, in, in, a, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to be showing you a slide. I'm going to be um, giving you a healthy choices by helping focus clip, which talks about living a smoke-free life. But by far the most potent factor in the risk for bladder cancer is smoking. So all you smokers out there, stop your smoking. Smoking actually quadruples the risk of developing cancer. It quadruples the risk of developing cancer. That really is quite significant. And that's in the women. In the men, there's a 50% chance of developing bladder cancer if you smoke. So <laughs> that's, you know, if, if that's a take home message, please, if, that, if that's for somebody watching, please take that message home. The next risk factor is age. Bladder cancer is rarely found in people under the age of 40 and it's usually um, for people who are 60 and above. So age, it's, it's, a, it's a condition that affects age people, aging people um, as the cells begin to degenerate and break down and the process of cell repair 
is not as good and of course people who are older may have been exposed to different environmental chemicals at work when health and safety was not an issue when they were young and working and those sorts of things. Gender is another risk factor and bladder cancer is twice as common in men as it is in women. So men, as, as, you know, as I said, have more chance of um, developing bladder cancer than women. Other risk factors, ethnic background. So white, the white male over 60 is at more at risk of having bladder cancer, especially if he's a smoker as well. So white Caucasian men are at a higher risk of developing uh, bladder cancer. And there are other ethnic groups as well that, that there might be a risk involved, but particularly in the white male um, population. Exposure to chemicals at work also predisposes a person to develop um, bladder cancer, particularly the dyes and the rubbers and the textiles, Benz benzidine, arsenic, and there are other dif different types of chemicals and plastics. Back in those days in the factories where there was no health and safety, plastic paints, arsenics, etc., all predisposed people and are very high risks for getting bladder cancer. People who have recurrent urinary infections, so they get recurrent and frequent infections. People with untreated bladder stones or kidney stones are also more likely to develop um, uh, bladder cancer. People who have had previous treatment for other kinds of cancers, especially cancers in the pelvic area, like cervical cancer. Women have had radiotherapy for cervical cancer. They're more likely to develop uh, bladder cancer as well. People who have pre-existing medical conditions, such as type 2 diabetes, particularly if they take a drug called pyoglitazone, which is now being discontinued, it, that increases their risk of up to, by up to 20% of getting bladder cancer. Another important risk factor, especially for those who like to barbecue and to fry their food, meat cooked at very high temperatures can produce amines, heterocyclic amines, which are directly implicated in the uh, causing of bladder cancer. HCAs, heterocyclic amines, are produced when meat is cooked at very high temperatures. So barbecuing, frying, you know, your fried chicken and all that sort of thing is not a good idea on a regular basis. And of course, as I keep saying, it's the 80-20 rule. If you eat healthily 80% of the time, then the 20% where you occasionally don't wouldn't matter too much. And it's also important to limit red meat consumption because again like in bowel cancer which I talked about before people who eat a lot of red meat especially processed red meat pork beef lamb on a regular basis have a one and a half times chance of getting bladder cancer than somebody who doesn't eat a lot of red meat and I'm not saying don't eat any red meat at all I'm just saying eat it in moderation not more than twice a week base your diet mainly on white meat like fish and chicken. Other risk factors I've already mentioned, family history is a risk factor. If somebody in the family has got bladder cancer, then it, there's a more likelihood that a person can get uh, bladder, bladder cancer. Kidney stones, bladder stones, people who are born with certain birth defects, again, are more likely to get bladder, uh, bladder cancer. Uh, schistosomiasis doesn't affect us in this country. I'm actually amazed that I can say the word myself, but schistosomiasis is a condition, it's an infection uh, of a particular nasty parasite that you find in hot countries and it is implied and it certainly does lead to bladder cancer as well as people who have indwelling catheters for long periods of time. So people who, for whatever reason, cannot pass urine due to some neurological problem, due to an accident which has caused them paralysis and loss of bladder function. Uh, people who have regularly, uh, regularly continuous indwelling catheters are also at risk of having bladder cancer. I've already mentioned schistosomiasis there, an infection that applies into countries in hot 
climate. So you're watching Health in Focus. This is Dr. Richardson, Dr. Laura Richardson, talking about bladder cancer. Now I'd like to take you to a Healthy Choices Health in Focus uh, clip, which talks about smoking and its relation to bladder cancer. So we'll see you back after this Healthy Choices clip. Now, so many times smokers are nagged into smoking, stop smoking. They hear all about the negative things that happens with smoking. You know, cancer this, you know, COPD this, emphysema this, needing oxygen this, etc., etc. Well, I'd like to try a different approach today. I'd like to talk about the benefits of a smoke-free life. And first of all, I'd just like to remind you of what cigarette contains, as you can see, contains all sorts of interesting things and all sorts of noxious chemicals. But that's the bad news. The good news is a smoke-free life means a reduction in the risk of disability or death due to cancer, heart and lung disease. A smoke-free life means a reduction of gangrene due to amputations because of circulatory problems. A smoke-free life means improved health to those, not just to you, but to those who are around you because you're not exposing them to passive smoking. A smoke-free life means reduction of the chance of your children developing asthma or glue ear. And guess what? For those who are trying to conceive, a smoke-free life means improved fertility and chances of a healthy pregnancy and baby. Improved breathing and general fitness in your body. Enjoyment of the taste of food and the smell of food. Because one of the things that nicotine does is it bungs up your olfactory system. Hey, it saves you money as well. And you don't have the problem that you're constantly smelling of tobacco. Guess what, ladies, especially, because I bet you're interested, it stops the rapid breakdown of collagen in your skin, and so you remain wrinkle-free longer, and your teeth ding, are healthier, much longer, and not tobacco-stained. And you'll find confidence, because more people would approach you as you're not worrying so much about the smell of cigarette. You may be approached socially more and you'll also have a fresh smelling home and fire no-go zone. Lots of fire accidents are actually started by people who smoke. Now October is smoke-free month and you need to get onto this website. I am a level two smoking cessation advisor. So if you need more information, contact me at Laura at Revelation TV. Smoking skills, having a smoke-free life will save your life. It will help you to enjoy a better life and you will be so glad you did. So why don't you join the thousands of people out there who are becoming smoke-free every day. Now you know the benefits, go for it. You've been watching Healthy Choices brought to you by Healthy Focus. And welcome back to Health in Focus, and this is Bladder Cancer Part 1. I hope you found that Healthy Choices clip very informative. I was talking about risk factors for bladder cancer, and before the end of the program, I'd just like to very, very briefly talk about the symptoms of bladder cancer, but I certainly will be finishing that off in Part 2, as well as talking about the all-important dietary and preventative measures that one can take to help to reduce considerably the risk of bladder cancer. And of course, you know, smoking will certainly be on my list. And for those of you who don't know, I am a level two smoking cessation advisor. What that means is that I have been trained in, in the hospital and been on a training course and practicing um, advising people on the different ways that they can give up smoking and the different techniques. I certainly don't use any cookie spooky techniques like hypnosis and all the rest of it or acupuncture. It's just simple counselling patients, engaging with them and discussing their pitfalls and where they, they have the risks of, of falling off the wagon as it were, either due to social pressures or due to stress and how to combat those and how to actually preempt them and, and what actions they can take to, to stop them falling back into the same old habits. So I'm a smoking cessation counsellor, so if you do need any advice about 
a smoking cessation, you can e email me at laura at revelationtv.com. And by the way, I've, I've also got a Facebook page. Did you know that? Health in Focus Revelation TV. So if you'd like to be my Facebook friend, just type in Health in Focus Revelation TV. And I think to date I have about 73 friends or so. So it'd be great to um, come on board if you want to be a friend of Health in Focus and certainly do that. But back to bladder cancer, just before the end of this, um, this part one of the program, I'd like to very briefly talk about the symptoms that can result from bladder cancer. And one of the most common symptoms, the most common signs and symptoms is blood in the urine, something also known as hematuria. Hematuria is a common sign of bladder cancer. Now remember that cancer is not always due to, I mean, blood in the urine is not always due to cancer, but if you've got blood in your urine, it's important not to ignore it. So hematuria, which is blood in the urine, a lot of the time you'll find that this may be either due to um, a, a urine infection that you've had. So go and see your doctor, they'll do a urine dipstick and send it off to the labs. Another common symptom of bladder cancer is frequency, passing urine frequently, wanting to go to the toilet all the time. But again, that could be a symptom of a urine infection. Recurrent infections, recurrent urine infections may also indicate possible underlying bladder cancer. And finally, the urge to go to pass urine, sudden urges to pass urine may also be an indication or bladder cancer. Now you're watching Health in Focus, this is Bladder Cancer Part 1. I shall be back shortly with Bladder Cancer Part 2 when I'll be talking about diet and lifestyle. Thank you for watching. Join me again. Quit smoking, prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. Take care, bye.